Whoa. In today's video, we're going to count down the top 10 worst weapons in World War II. What's up, warriors? Welcome to the channel. I hope you're enjoying what we do here, and if you are, then please remember to like, share, and subscribe. This week, we are back with our top 10 series, and today we are counting down the top 10 worst weapons in World War II. So let's go! Number 10, the unrotated projectile. This was a ship-mounted aerial mine rocket launcher. Sounds pretty cool. It was created to protect the ships from the enemy's planes. The idea was that the unrotated projectile would be fired from the ship. Then upon reaching 1,000 feet, would explode and disperse mines attached to the parachutes by the 400 feet of cable. Or so was hoped. They wanted to create an aerial minefield where the enemy's plane would get trapped in the mess of the cables, meaning they could pull the mine to the main body of the aircraft and down the plane. However, the mines, the cables and the parachutes were easily visible, so the enemy pilots had no trouble flying above or below the aerial minefield. And if that wasn't enough, the undetonated mines would be at the mercy of the wind and often turned back round on the British ships that fired them. Well, that one didn't go to plan. Number 9, Goliath. Goliath was a German miniature tracked vehicle. It was designed to deliver an explosive device by the remote control. There were two types, the battery powered or the larger petrol engine version. But the trailing control wires were weak and the vehicle itself was slow and had pretty poor ground clearance. So then the Germans experimented with larger radio controlled vehicles, but these two were a waste of resources. Number eight, Smith gun. famous Britain's home guard was known for making do with outdated weapons. This is because they wanted to concentrate on the regular army having the up-to-date equipment. But the British Army Major William H. Smith intended to put that right when he retired. He knew there were very few anti-tank guns, so he got to work. He designed an unusual creation for a three-inch smooth barreled gun, which was put in production in 1941. After many safety improvements had been made, 4,000 guns were produced. The Smith gun had to be tipped on its side to fire, with one of its wheels acting as a base, but it had a low muzzle and was only accurate at about 200 yards. That was assuming that the ammunition was available to fire, which it rarely was. Number seven, Covenanter. The Covenanter was designed in 1939 and looked pretty good on the drawing board. It had large wheels, low profile and sloped armour, but it suffered from major engine cooling problems which were never overcome. It was so unreliable that it never went to war and the tanks that were made were only used in training. At least the 1,771 tanks were put to some use. Number six, the V2. One of Hitler's revenge weapons was the V2 rocket. It was Germany's most advanced weapon of the Second World War. This was a large ballistic missile carrying a one ton warhead. It would reach the edge of space before descending at supersonic speed towards its target. The V2 was technically brilliant, but inflicted little damage for the mass amount spent on it. The total quantity of explosives that could be delivered by the V2 was far less than could be dropped in a single raid by an RAF bomber command. 9,000 people were actually killed by the V2 attacks. Tragically, a far greater number of slave workers died building these weapons. Don't give stupid people money because they spend it on stupid things. Number five, the mouse. The Maus was a super heavy German tank 
completed in 1944. Hitler desired to produce an indestructible super heavy tank. So they made the heaviest fully enclosed armoured fighting vehicle ever built. The complete vehicle was 33 foot and 6 inches long, 12 foot and 2 inches wide and 11 foot 9 inches high, weighing 188 metric tons. Trials began in 1943 but there were constant mechanical problems with the drivetrain. The trucks were driven by electric motors powered by a huge aircraft engine but the top speed was barely 12 miles per hour. Although there were plans to build 150 of these tanks, only two prototypes, two hulls and one turret were ever completed. Number 4. Mark 14 Torpedo The Mark 14 torpedo was the United States Navy's standard submarine launched anti-ship torpedo. What a mouthful. This weapon had many problems which crippled its performance early on in the war. The US fleet-wide standard torpedo ran 10 to 12 feet below what it had been set for. This was thanks to a misaligned depth sensor. It also failed to explode when it passed beneath the ships. This was down to the Mark VI Magnetic Influence Exploder. It had been tested in New England waters, which as you can guess were magnetically very different from the South Pacific. Even when it managed to hit a ship, the result was often just a loud clang, as the contact exploder would break apart. Number three, the anti-tank dogs. Anti-tank dogs were taught to carry explosives to tanks, armoured vehicles and any other military target. They were used against the German tanks in World War II. The idea to strap an explosive to a dog's back and teach it to crawl beneath the German tanks was not just cruel, but stupid. Initially, the dogs were trained to leave a time-detonated bomb and retreat. The problem was that they used their own tanks to train these dogs teaching them to crawl beneath tanks that stank of diesel, while the Germans were gasoline fueled and had a completely different smell. During the battle noise and confusion of the war, the dogs often sniffed out a familiar smell, a smell they had been trained with. You can guess the result. Poor pups. Number two, the Heinkel 177. Heinkel 177 was a long-range heavy bomber. Its introduction to combat was delayed by problems with its engines and frequent changes to its intended role. Much of the blame goes to Aust Udert, who was a World War I German who championed dive bombing. He had his favourite planes for the task, but now he wanted the 177 to dive bomb too. But a 60 degree dive in an aeroplane with three tonne engines on each wing requires huge structural demand. So surprise, surprise, many fell apart during flight. On top of that, as a weight saving measure, they didn't even have firewalls to protect them. So if they managed to stay in one piece, they caught fire. Although I think Hitler loved it, he quoted, this garbage plane is of course the biggest piece of junk that was probably ever produced. Don't think I'll be catching a flight anytime soon. And number one, the Great Pandandrum. The Great Pandandrum was a massive rocket propelled explosive laden cart designed by the British military in World War II. It was one of a number of highly experimental projects and was never used in battle. It was designed by the engineer Neville Shute, who is now responsible for designing one of the silliest weapons of World War II. It had a pair of 10 foot wooden wheels with an axle between them containing a two ton drum of TNT, propelling it with 70 fueled rockets around the rim of each wheel. It was said to be launched off a ramp of a landing craft just off a Normandy beachhead, where it would roar up the beach at 60 miles per hour and smash up the Atlantic wall defences. Or so they said. Testing this weapon didn't go smoothly. When launched, it hurtled towards the coast, skimming the beach before turning back out to sea. Then a number of rockets flew aggressively above the heads of a gathered audience, or exploded underwater. Despite these failings, they carried on testing. Then comes the final test and the end to this awful weapon. To start, it rolled into the sea and began to head to shore. Then a rocket broke loose and another and another. Next, it hit a small crater in the sand 
were disintegrated into violent explosions, with rockets tearing across the beach at great speed. I don't think you can be a threat to your enemies when you're a bigger danger to yourself. Idiots. So that's it guys, our top 10 worst weapons of World War II. Thanks for watching our video. Please remember to support us by liking, sharing and subscribing. And I'll catch you again soon.